In the gallant days when history hung on the flight of an arrow or the slash of a sword. When feudal barons ravaged the countryside to live in pomp and splendor. It is truly colorful, exciting, fascinating entertainment every minute of the way. Moon Sea Adventures. Hello and welcome to the Moon Sea Adventures. We are here and the Moon Sea Adventurers have shifted and the adventure as always continues on. Um, you may recognize some of these faces, but I will briefly allow each person to introduce themselves and their character with a little bit of uh, detail. And then we're gonna play a little game called How I Met Your Mother or really How I Met Your Pilgrim. Um, well, we'll get into that in a second. So uh, Tyler, start us off, introduce yourself and your character. Uh, well, my character is Jaunt. He's uh, sort of an old, uh, weathered, uh, slightly crusty, former town drunken bum that was uh, um, lucky to have been bestowed uh, upon him the faith of Farlongen, uh, the uh, wandering god, and uh, embraced the, the pilgrim's uh, path and uh, wandering the world and encountering adventures. <clears throat> and um, he's uh, sort of got a long, uh, bushy, unkempt beard and uh, leather cap. Um, and the, uh, the clothes typical of the pilgrims of Farlong and which are, you know, just a step above uh, rags and, and, and uh, cast off leather, this and that. And, um, Carries a, uh, a bow staff and a wooden shield made of a, a crate lid and just very basic, basic uh, individual. But uh, fun loving, loving life and um, loving uh, walking the path of, of his, uh, his God. Nice, nice. And uh, Mike, what is your character? Who is your character? Uh, tell us a little bit about your new character for this campaign. Okay, my character is Moriana Grunewald. She is a half-elf druid. Um, she's um, got green eyes, honey brown hair, and copper skin, curly uh, honey brown hair. She has um, spent a lot of time, or the last 10 years, I would say, in the woods, getting um, in touch with herself, with Sorry. nature, and all the animals in, in nature. She's not really a people person, but she'd rather spend time out in the woods with animals and nature. And she will. All, she's also very attuned to them and she defends nature like it's her home. It is her home and she would defend it to the death if she needs to. Awesome. Um, and Kale. Tell us a little bit about your new character, <clears throat> Rollfish. Yeah, so Rollfish is a half orc, um, kind of chaotic beard alignment, kind of. Uh, he's pretty tall. He's six foot, and uh, he's pretty. I'd say he's young for an orc. He's twenty eight. Gray skin, full beard. Um, it's all uh, kind of like brown black hair. Uh, he's a what was he? A uh, College of Swords bard. He, he learned from another odd orc uh, who was also a bard and became an odd one himself. So he's kind of like a, uh, he goes where the wind takes him. He loves to wander and find uh, interesting things and display his prowess because he doesn't really inspire others. He inspires himself to do fantastic feats. Nice. All right. Last but not least, Heath. Tell us about your new character. My new character is a dragonborn barbarian named Varos Sarkany. And um, he is of the Lathander faith. And that means the renewal or rebirth or birth or also known as the morning Lord. Um, and because of my beliefs that there is something bigger and better and more lawful, I left my evil red dragon ancestry behind and I was shunned because I believed in something bigger than what I saw there. And uh, out on the road, I find these fine fellows. And do we have any women in the, in the crew? 
No, uh, Moriana, well, I mean, Moriana. You know, Moriana's Moriana. uh, definitely, but that's that's a good segue into the how you guys met so i'm going to actually throw the ball over to tyler's court and he is going to provide a a flashback a scenario um in which his character jaunt the pilgrim was traveling he's going to give you each a prompt to kind of set it up and then you're going to describe what went down and this is kind of how each of one of you uh met jaunt Okay, Tyler, take it away. Uh, I think Jaunt was uh, growing increasingly concerned with the sort of uh, chaotic, seedy, nefarious element that he was getting swept into in uh, Flan and uh, consulted his, uh, his compass, which was given to him by his mentor, um, uh, Pilgrim, it's uh, he, his background is the inheritor background, and uh, and what he inherited was this this brass compass, very basic, simple brass compass that doesn't necessarily always point north; it points some direction. And he believes I don't know if it's true or not. I don't know if it's an enchanted item, but he believes that wherever this direction points on this compass, that's his god far along, and nudging him in that that direction, saying, "Go to this horizon in this direction." direction and there you'll find your next uh your that, that's where your path will lead and so you know seeking that inspiration he uh left flan wandering outside of town following paths here and there in the direction of this compass with this faith that that's where he's supposed to go um i think he comes up over a rise um the path sort of peters out um he's not sure exactly where to go so he enters right into the forest um, deeper and darker and, and uh, eventually becoming pretty lost, not knowing, you know, where he is going or where he should go at this point. And um, suddenly he feels a pressure, a tension on his ankle and a rope trap seizes on his foot, flipping him upside down and up into a tree where he dangles helplessly. And uh, he hears a noise in the uh, in the bushes, some twigs being cracked, and um, out from the foliage steps. Do I choose somebody? <laughs> steps Moriana. Moriana. Oh, well, I was just about to say it. <laughs> so, who do we have here, my fellow traveler, or shall I say, intruder? What are you doing here in my forest? Oh, uh, apologies, uh, Miss. I uh, you were right the first time. I'm I am but a fellow traveler. I I'm just uh, on my merry way, but uh, I seem to be uh, finding myself in a bit of a bind. Uh, have I stepped into your trap, good lady? Indeed, you have. Indeed, you have. I am the the protector of this area, and. I would like to know your intentions. Do you have, uh, do you seek to do harm to the animals of the woods? Never, never, ma'am. I am a friend to uh, all animals and all woods and, uh, and all travelers. And that, oh. that is the sole I intent uh, of my, uh, my presence here in your beautiful, beautiful forest. Uh, as beautiful that, as you, good lady. Thank you. Seeing that you are a fellow traveler, I will cut you down and then maybe we can help each other or I can help you on your way that you find your way through these woods. They are very dangerous. So I with, cut down. with that, you guys, you know, you, you lower jaunt down, um, you lead him back kind of towards your camp uh, where you have a, a fire going and a kettle full of uh, freshly gathered mushrooms, herbs, spices, and a bunch of naturally occurring vegetables, maybe some beans, some legumes. Um, and it's it's a very vegan friendly meal <laughs> that you then begin to enjoy and consume. And it's wonderful. And, and this spot of the forest is actually quite peaceful. Um, and, and as you guys kind of share a meal together, Moriana, you explain to, to Jaunt that this little patch of forest used to be 
much bigger, but that uh, there was a time several centuries ago when the orc tribes that ruled the Thar just clear cut the forest for the purpose of, of building defensive fortifications for their different um, outposts. And, uh, and now the, the meager woods that's left is not more than a couple miles. Um, but that, you know, you also, Moriana, know that um, as you head east towards the Moonwatch Hills, that there have been some disturbances very recently that you have encountered. Um, things that are abnormal in nature, things that should not be happening in nature. And you're wondering if perhaps Jaunt could help you investigate this. Um, and by abnormal, I mean, there have been animals that have been seen who are, who are just rabid, just ferocious, animals that should not be, um, you know, for example, carnivorous, have been found to attack people on the road. Um, okay. And just other strange kind of abnormalities and developments that seem to go against the, the, the tenets of, of the natural order. And it's definitely something that the Moriana would want to eradicate from the woods, something that does not belong. Yeah, and Jaunt seems like a trustworthy person. So you, you guys kind of, um, you know, the, the next morning you leave and you begin heading east. And uh, Jaunt, pick up the narrative from here. You are heading east into the Moonwatch Hills. All right. Um, well, as we uh, enter the the low uh, hills uh, that begin the the Moonwatch Range, um, we each get a sort of uh, tingly feeling. The hair standing up on the back of our neck. We're we're both uh, on alert. Something feels not quite right um we uh you hear, you hear just over the rise of the hill in front of you perhaps a hundred yards away you hear the sounds of yelping and barking and howling you hear that lady let's investigate let's go see what's going on there you're not sure if it's wolves or coyotes or something all right. Well, I steal myself with my my wooden shield and and brandish my uh, staff defensively and and cautiously head up over the rise. I also okay. have my quarter staff in the hand in my hand. As you head up over the rise, you get to the crest of this rise and looking down hill, you see a group of four dogs, not coyotes, not wolves. These look like domesticated dogs but they're acting in a feral kind of fashion. You see even their fur is kind of like shaggy and they're all of them are foaming at the mouth. And you see that they are kind of surrounding this one solid tree that's just off the road. And up in the tree, you see a half orc. <laughs> um, so you guys are about 60 feet away from this pack of four rabid dogs that have treed this half orc and he's you could see he's kind of like gauging what's around him what do you do i would like to cast create bonfire it has a 60 foot range it makes a five foot square and any creature in this uh area has to make a dex save Nice. Nice. All right. Let's see if you scare off the, uh, the rabid dogs. Um, two of them made saves, two of them didn't. So two of them get scorched by the, the heat of the fire and they yelp and they kind of run off. The other two kind of jump out of the way of the fire and they circle back around and now they're ferociously trying to jump up um, at the man in the tree. Uh, Jaunt, what do you do? Uh, I think I'm going to try out my new magic missile ability. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, hit, uh, I think one of them twice and the other one once. Oh, uh, and let's see. I don't uh, roll. I just, yeah, roll damage. you just roll damage. Yep. Uh, nine total three. I rolled one D or yeah, one D four, and I got a three 
and I times that by three. I think you roll each time for each missile. Yeah, you you roll each time. So it's one d four plus one. So you you got four on the first one. Four sends him running. Three on the second. Okay. And three on the third. Okay. So you don't kill any of them, but you definitely send them running. <laughs> um, man in the tree. You see these two figures up at the top of a hill about 60 feet away. Uh, one of them is um, a half elf uh, maiden. And she. you saw that she had evoked something. And you saw this bonfire that still is kind of burning just you know below the tree. The other looks like a, a human man with a long beard. And they are now kind of um, <clears throat> jogging up towards you. As they come up, they see a half orc, which they may or may not, depending on them, be a little uh, cautious at first. But he's not waving any weapons. He just says, "Hello, fellow travelers. Thank you, thank you. I was those dogs came out of nowhere and ran me up the tree. And I mean, I was just about to take care of it myself, of course. But I really appreciate you two coming along and helping me out. What did you do to?" provoke these dogs i didn't provoke these dogs these dogs were rabid of some sort i don't understand the cause but i saw lots of foam coming out of their mouth uh roll fish one thing that you know yes. that you have encountered as you've been traveling as well mm-hmm. is that mm-hmm. a lot of the animals in this area wild <clears throat> and domestic seem to be infected with some kind mm-hmm. of strange disease you have even seen um, goats like that have gone full yeah. like carnivore and yeah. have, have attacked and taken down other animals and eaten their flesh. Um, okay. You have I'll, yet I'll to see any it. of these kind of effects happen in horses. Okay. But in almost every other situation, you know, canines, uh, you know, foxes, coyotes, wolves. Yeah. Um, even smaller creatures, like you've seen like badgers and raccoons and skunks that have just been <clears throat> totally aggressive and rabid. Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll add, strange thing is, this isn't the first time I've seen this type of activity out of, uh, out of animals in the area. Yeah, what about, have you seen it? Happening. Huh. We've seen it. Uh, we've encountered this as well. Definitely something strange is happening with the animals in this in these woods. Well, I think it's, it's I think it's safer to travel in numbers right now. If uh, if you guys don't mind having a half orc along, uh, some of my best friends have been half orcs. That's good to hear. Well, two of them. You you guys uh, a- after kind of making sure that there aren't any dogs coming back circling back around you. You, you continue to the east, and for uh, the rest of the day, um, into the late afternoon, you are traveling through the Moonwatch Hills. And after going another, um, essentially, you're, you're almost kind of exiting the Moonwatch Hills as you head towards Melvant, and you figure you're probably only about 15 miles away from the port city of Melvant. But um, John, suddenly you get a feeling like the tingle in the back of your neck and you, you pull out your compass and you see that your compass has changed. Your compass has indicated to you that you should abruptly turn north. Now, you know that by turning north, you would actually be heading into the Thar, a dangerous, wild area full of many kinds of creatures. Um, swampy lands and kind of badlands mixed, uh, known to be the locale of various orc tribes and even wild humanoid uh, tribes of other races uh, and goblins and ogres and other swamp dwell- dwelling creatures. But you you are certain in your soul that Farlangan is is leading you to the north. The reason why you are not sure but you see that your compass is now indicating that you should head north. All right, we'll stop and uh, take off my pack, get out of the bottle of booze that's in there, not the fine elven wine, but the sort of standard, I'm not even sure what kind of spirit is in there, but take a big 
draw off that and offer it up to my traveling friends and say, friends, I, I, I feel compelled to alter our journey and take us north. I feel my God far long and is, is guiding us all there, just as he guided me to you, dear lady, and, and guided us to you, Rolfish. Uh, I hope you'll be brave enough to, to go with me because I agree there is strength in numbers and, and, uh, and good things come to those who travel together. And, and if you at all are all at all afeard of, of headed north into danger and, and, uh, and nefarious lands and perhaps this rock gut will help steal your nerves. <laughs> Take a drink of the whatever it is and say, I go where the wind takes me. Ah, very good. And hand it back. I take a small sip and I say to John, John, I'm not a believer of gods. I do not follow a, a God. I follow nature is my God. And if my God has, or nature has brought me to you and you feel compelled to go to, into the North and to the Thar where I know that I can help you or help us as a group get through there, then I'll be with you. Very good. You have my thanks, lady. And with that, you guys turn and begin heading off path, off road to the north. Um, you, you kind of pass through the low hills of what remains and of, 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 um, of the Moonwatch Hills, but then you, in the distance and the horizon, as you head to the north and the sun is kind of starting to set, you see the the vestiges of the open grasslands. They're, they're, the the trees become kind of more sparse and fewer um, and farther between as you kind of approach this area that goes from open grasslands into kind of wet, mucky areas uh, with occasional kind of outcroppings of, of higher ground that are a little more dry. Um, but there's a lot of just damp areas with, <clears throat> as far as you could see, I mean, you know, for, for miles ahead of you with nothing in sight other than the sporadic occasional tree. And a lot of these trees, by the way, are like dead trees. Like they're, they're trees that, that, you know, were hit by lightning or they're trees that, you know, were flooded out and the roots died and they're, you know, collapsed or, you know, hanging up against another adjacent tree. Um, as you progress through, you, you also see uh, more and more you see tree stumps that look like they were not cut down recently, but perhaps, you know, decades or even a century ago. But you see, you see tree stumps in these different spots that sporadically pop up and and kind of lead to a patch of dry ground for a while. As you are traveling, you have traveled now for about 10 miles. It is nighttime. Um, the moon above is, is very much obscured by clouds. So you do not have a lot of light. Uh, for those of you who have dark vision, this is not a huge deal. Um, for Jaunt, you, you basically can't walk any further without some kind of light uh what do you do for light uh i cast uh light on the tip of my uh bow staff walking stick combo okay. and uh use that to light my way okay as you guys are proceeding you see up ahead in the distance and this this could be just i mean it's on the horizon so it's really hard to tell several hundred yards away, you see the flicker of light. And it looks like perhaps uh, there's like a tree in the silhouette of that light. So perhaps some kind of campfire and a tree that's silhouetted. Cautious friends, you know this area. Okay. So you, you are moving forward, presumably, towards this. Um, I want each one of you to make stealth rolls. First roll. All right. What is my stealth? New character, who this? Stealth is... 
20. Oh, nice. Natural 19 for a 21. I got the same thing. Nice. Can I do survival instead of stealth? No. <laughs> <laughs> that's an eight. All right. That's oh, fine. Oh, no. <laughs> so, so, again, up ahead, you guys are trying to be stealthy. Some of you are. Uh, Moriana, like, maybe, you know, steps in a mucky spot and there's like a loud splashing noise, but you seem to be far enough away. Um, Jaunt, in order to remain so stealthy, though, you kind of have to hold your your light low to the ground so that it's not like a beacon waving out. You know, you're, you kind of <laughs> flashlight it at the ground just in front of you, and you're you're making your way up. You guys get within about sixty feet, and what you see ahead is a campfire, indeed, and you see four kind of short, squat humanoid bodies sitting around the campfire. And you also see someone tied up to the tree. And that someone does not have human features. No, that someone has a prominent head and brow and pointed horns and, and kind of a crest. And that someone seems to be tied up to the tree and seems to be to have been captured by this group of four squat, bulbous headed creatures who are silhouetted by the fire. So you are 60 feet away. What do you do? Can we recognize what these creatures are? I will let you make rolls. Okay. Um, I will let you make either perception or nature rolls. I'll take the perception. I'll make perception. Oh, they're both the same for me. Plus one. That's a nat 20 plus six, so 26. I got a Seven. four. <laughs> okay, so um, so Moriana, you you have seen these creatures before. You, you know them by their bulbous heads and their short squat bodies. They are very common in the Thar, and these are bullywogs. Jaunt, you have heard of bullywogs, but you've never seen them before. What you see kind of from the back almost does look like the back of like a frog or toad head, but with, you know, but wearing clothes, like they have like furs on and they, they, they seem to have weapons, although not in hand at the ready, but they are kind of sitting around this fire. Um, and again, you see that there is someone tied to the tree and, and you could see there's ropes around their body, but there's also a rope maybe holding in a gag or something around their mouth. And the person who is tied to the tree, they that is about 15 feet away from the the four bullywogs that are around the fire. And they're sitting around the fire. How far away are they from each other then? They're about five feet away from each other. So they, they sort of make like a semicircle with their backs currently to you. I think I could help. Uh, I think we're we're like close together talking. Yes, you guys can whisper to each other. You're about yeah. 60 feet away. I whisper over to the others. That's a strange one. They got tied up there. Think we should help them? Yes. I'm, uh, I'm honor bound to help those in need. And, and no matter how ugly a fellow that appears to be, <laughs> he appears in need. He or she. Um, uh, you guys, as you are plotting this, uh, some of you have very good passive perceptions. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> Moriana, you hear some movement about 30 feet to the west of where you guys are. Mm -hmm. I'm like, just whispering. Not quite a splash, <laughs> but just like a little bit of the sound of like something like sinking into the mud about 30 feet west of where you guys are. Make a perception check. Yeah. So then I can go around, do this and that, and then I'll hit him from behind. That's a 13. Okay, you, you turn to look where you heard that sound and you see some small form leap up from a pile of muck. 
Time to roll initiative, everybody. Ah! In the middle of my thing. <laughs> 18. Ooh, All right, Jaunt has an 18. Oh, 12. <laughs> Nat one, so that'd be a three for me. <laughs> Goldfish has a 12. Moriana has a three. I think I got scared. <laughs> He didn't do as bad as me. Roll double ones with a negative one dex. On a different game. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay, Jaunt. You, out of the corner of your eye, see something move about 30 feet to the west of you, towards you, like jumping and moving towards you. And you see a Bullywog, who you guys did not previously see, jumping out with a spear to attack you guys. He's moving in towards you. <clears throat> Other bullywogs by the campfire do not seem to have noticed you guys yet. And I can I can act? Yes, you were up first. I'm going to whisper some magic words into my fist and then with a somatic gesture, blast a firebolt at him. Ooh. All right, oh, go ahead and make your attack roll. Uh, seven. Lucky that, is, <laughs> that is a miss. Yes. Um, he is now going to protect you guys. And rolls a 19. So somebody's going to be ouched. Somebody's going to be ouched for five damage. Uh, let's see. Is it going to be Jaunt, Rolfish, or Moriana? It is Rolfish who will take five damage as a spear pokes you. Um, Rolfish, it is now your turn, however. Let me take that damage. Okay. okay. <clears throat> With a yelp, he pulls out his longsword and goes in for a slash. Ooh, with a natural 18. That is a hit. Roll damage. Oh, that's pretty good. That is 11 slashing damage. That is exactly enough to drop him. And drop him you did, which was good because, um, Moriana, you see that the bullywogs by the fire have heard the the sound basically and you see them kind of like turning around towards you guys but you are up first and they're 60 feet away yes okay then i would uh, create bonfire <laughs> and <laughs> next to their yeah. bonfire okay they need uh big save spell save dc is what is a uh, 14 only one of them makes it so three of them uh, are going to get the pain so they Bring take the thunder. Uh, they take six damage. Wow! All right. It is a D eight. That is um, uh, that is wow. Um, all right. They are last. So one of them, actually, all four of them, <clears throat> grab spears and they start springing towards you guys, and they move uh very effectively through the wet areas. Hmm. Um, long jump 20 feet hmm. so that's not enough to make it within range but next next round they will be um, which brings us back to you jaunt so the the sneaky bullywog was killed by rollfish but there are four more moving towards you guys how far uh, are we? Is our little group so from? They, they are now. They they spent double their movement, so they are now twenty feet away from you. And how far away is the tree that um, the sixty feet away? Sixty. Yes. Um, I'm gonna dash um, to the tree just to okay. see if I can free this mystery individual. 
I will say that you, you kind of have to do that on a diagonal to avoid them cutting you down. Okay. You run through them. They get sure. opportunity attacks. Serpentine. So you're, yeah, you kind of go around and I'll say that next round you can assess or help out the person who's been tied to the tree. So you get okay. there this round, but next round you can do something. Um, that brings us to Rollfish. There are four bullywogs that are 20 feet away from you. They will be at you next right. round. Rollfish looks over at Moriana. Time to flex my spell casting. And how, how close are they? Are they like in a line or they are they are five feet apart from each other? Yeah. So they're they leaped, they did these mm -hmm. two massive leaps towards you guys. Okay. So I pick a point between the two on the left and uh, five feet in between them or whatever, and I cast shatter at them. They need to make a con save, uh, DC 12. Con is, well, they're, they're not horrible with con. So they have a plus one to con. Oh my God. All right, only one of them succeeded. Okay. That's 3d8, that's... That is nine plus, ooh, that's uh, 17 thunder damage uh, so, for us. For That's for a fail save and half as much on a save. Okay, so the guy that made his save takes eight, and the, other, the others all take 17, right? Uh, yeah, it's only within a 10 foot, so I picked the point in between two of them, so it hit two at least. Right. Yeah. So one blows back dead the other one like falls to the side mm -hmm. um and that is very ouch all right uh moriana so they are 20 feet away from us now they're 20 feet away and there are only three of them left okay you um, saw Daunt make like a, a zigzag over to the person who's tied up at the tree and and then you saw you looked over and rollfish did this epic spell that blasted thunder and, and but there's still three of them coming at you all three of them are wounded okay i'm going to move up so that i'm 10 feet away from them and i'm going to cast poison spray aha and that is a con save and yeah. if they con saves yeah okay these yeah. are their roles a nat 20, an 18, and a 14. So all three of them made. So do they take okay. any half damage if they make? No, there's no half damage on this one. Okay. So, so you run up that. and you're like, ah, and you do the poison spray and they like, they like duck your clouds of poison before they rush into attack. Okay, the first one attacks you with a spear. Ooh. According to the Bill Allen Damage Alternative Scoring System, that nat 20 is going to yield you seven hit points in pain. Oh. Um, okay. Not yeah. as bad as it could have been. That could have been 12 hit points. Um, the second one attacks. Uh, that might not be a hit. Uh, AC 12? 13. Okay. And the third one is going to attack uh, Rollfish. AC mm -hmm. 14? Uh, nope, 15. Okay. You guys are now engaged in mortal combat with the Bullywogs. Meanwhile, back to the top of the order, Jaunt, you see something that you have not encountered before in your travels, and that is a member of the Dragonborn race. I want you to make a history check. Uh, where's history? Oh. 18. So um, you don't know a lot about Dragonborn, but you know that their basic coloring is indicative of their draconic ancestry. And what concerns you is that this one is colored red, which you know to be an evil draconic ancestry. Now, right. with a gag in its mouth, um, Heath, how is Boros uh, behaving as this human man with a beard comes up to assess him? <clears throat> so, so he's he seems to be 
completely tied up and incapable of speech as you see this chunk of cloth, this wad of cloth gagged in his mouth with a rope kind of banding it. I probably, even with just that, I probably pee a little bit because that's, I mean, I don't, that's probably frightening. Uh, but I still, I, I draw my dagger and I say, I don't know if you're friend or foe, but I hope after this that we are friends and cut his ropes. <clears throat> Thank you, friend. Now point me in the direction of the toads. <laughs> mm. and, that, and that's how that goes down. Next up in the order, Rollfish, you you have a, a spear wielding pissed off bullywug waving at you. All right, gonna slash with this long sword. Okay. Mm, that's a what is that? Uh, what's my plus on this? 21. Oh yeah. That that <laughs> oh yeah. That's uh 12 damage. Uh yep, that'll that'll do that. He drops. And I'm going to do uh, I'm going to do a slashing flourish. So as you take the attack action and return, you walk speed increases 10 feet until the end of the turn. And I'm going to expend oh no, that's not what I want. Crap. Bonus action. Bonus action. Nothing. Never mind. Sorry. Okay. All right. Well, you're still New successful character. in dropping him. Moriana, I move, you have, you have, I move up to help Moriana. Sorry. Okay. That's what I do. Okay. Moriana, you have two of them against okay. me, but you are up first. As a bonus action, I will cast Shalele, and then I will hit them with my quarterstaff. All right. And that is a, as the 10. Uh, no. Yes. They're too slippery for me. They are very <laughs> slippery. And one of them, I believe, hits with a 16. The other one misses with a 10. Yeah. You take another ouchie four damage. That's okay. And this brings us back to Jaunt. Jaunt, you free this dragonborn man who gets up and, and asks you to point him in the direction of the toads. When he stands up, uh, how, how tall is Jaunt again? Uh, 511. And, and when he stands up, the dragonborn stands up about how tall Heath? 7.5 feet. <laughs> you see now as, as he gets up from standing at the tree, why his head was still, he's, he's big. He's significantly larger in scale. Uh, now that he stands up from being tied up at the tree and, and he kind of stretches out. Now you don't have any of your weapons on you. So um, John, you see this guy stand up and he looks ready to, to get some revenge, but it is your turn. What do you, uh, what do you do this round? You look back uh -huh. and you see two bullywogs fighting against your two friends. Like in close, like, I, yeah. I it, like so Moriana, far. Moriana's fighting off two of them and you see Rolfish running over to help. Um, well, I'm afraid I would do firebolt again, but I'm afraid I'd, uh, I'd hurt the other guys. So I'm going to do uh sacred flame. So murmur some more words into my fist and summon a sacred flame down onto one of them. Uh, my, um, saving throw failed for sure. And that's a six. So what's the damage on that? Uh, I'm looking for my. Uh, eight. Dead. Excellent. Um, Boros, you see this human man must be some kind of holy man because you see him mutter words into his mouth and this bright light seems to come down from the sky and it illuminates one of the toad creatures that was part of the pack that cornered you and trapped you. And then the toad like shrieks in pain and drops into the muck. Um, this brings us to uh, Rollfish. Okay, this time I'm going to do a slashing flourish. So let's okay. attack first. Yep. Uh, that's a that's a twelve. Twelve. 
No, 13. I'm sorry. Yeah, 13 hits. All right. So that's five. And with Slashing Florist, that allows me to roll another damage die. This might be it, depending on what you roll. Uh, I think I said five, right? So yep. Eight. Eight total? Yep, that's eight tough. total. You, you flourish. How does this happen? Describe how this happens. Yep. This yeah. one guy left. <clears throat> he was about to stab uh, again, stab Moriana, who's taking quite yeah. a uh, uh, an attack, and you kind of run over. Describe how that happens. Watch out for our friend because he uses his own inspiration dice to fuel these um, flourishes. He's like, show him what a half fork is made of, and he just comes in and <laughs> just slashes right into him. <laughs> so, so Moriana, you see your friend become his own hype man. <laughs> as he encourages himself <laughs> and, and just jumps into action and cuts down the last of the bullywogs. Um, out of initiative order, uh, Voros, you see there's a pile of stuff, some of which includes your supplies, and then a bunch of which included the, what looks like the supplies of this pack of bullywogs. Uh, and the fire is going on this dry land spot. I will collect my things, okay. even though my revenge has been stolen from me. Okay. Um, Moriana and Rolfish, you guys see Jaunt, and apparently the person who he freed standing over on that patch of dry land, that kind of island of dry land with the tree and the fire. What do you guys do? Are you all right, Moriana? I'm fine, yeah. I walk, walk up to him cautiously. Okay. Follow. As you guys get up to this patch of dry land, um, Jaunt, you see the large dragonborn man sorting through this pile of stuff and kind of picking out things which appear to be his. Uh, <clears throat> well met, my um, gigantic friend. I, I am Jaunt, pilgrim of Far Longen. These are my I, I am pleased to meet your acquaintance. I am Voros, and I need blood for what has happened to me, but I welcome you and your companions, and I thank you for freeing me. Um, you, Rolfish, when you walk up to the hill, how, how tall is Rolfish? He's six foot. He's a beefy boy, too. He's, uh, you know, he's rocking 16 strength, so he ain't no small fry. Yeah, you, you walk up and you, you see that this dragonborn, who um, you also have never seen one in the wild, um, you, you've never seen a dragonborn, and th this he's big. Uh, and he, he has definitely a red hue to his, his scale tone. Um, mm -hmm. Moriana, you, you actually have seen dragonborn before. Um, in your travels, you actually were able to learn a bit of the draconic language and you are fluent in it and you see a, a descendant of the red dragon in front of you. So I walk up to him and in draconic, I ask him friend or foe friend. I hope that we've helped you. To I bring you to the woods. Friend. Friend. It, it seems as if the half elf woman is pretty fluent in draconic. She, she seems to speak it rather competently. Where have you learned my language? I've spent time with many, many cultures and many, many peoples. I've spent time with your kind Rome, on my travels, learning as much as I can from all people to help protect nature and all the animals and all the creatures that, vote, that work, that live here. That brings great comfort. I can appreciate what you're doing. And you guys notice that the fire seems to be pretty well stocked. There's there's a good pile of um, wood that's that's kind of next to the bonfire. Um, and as you guys are kind of getting to know each other, you see that there's there's also quite a bit of supplies. It looks like that these <clears throat> bullywogs have assembled 
whether from their own or from, you know, loot that they have gathered. Um, there are about six spears. There are four short bows and about 80 arrows, um, all of which seem serviceable. And you see that there are about six days of rations. And most of the rations are dried fish. Um, but they seem to be like serviceable. Like they, they don't seem to be rotten or anything like that. Oriana doesn't need any of that. The rations she doesn't need, she can get, she can find her way in the, in the woods, find things to eat. Okay. So you guys are, it's the middle of the night. You are, um, you know, you are at a dry spot. Uh, do you, what, what do you want to do? Do you want to kind of set up a camp here? Makes sense to me. I mean, I guess there's the possibility that more of these bullywogs, you call them, uh, might show up, but uh, maybe with a quick little reconnaissance around the area, we might, have the confidence to just set up camp here if everybody agrees. I think we can do that. We can also take take turns taking watch. May I stay at your campsite? Yes, of course. John? Please, please I'm do. I'm fine. fine with anything. Thank you Love for your more hospitality. Company. Seems like you have more claim to the campsite than we would. I am not from here, friend. I have only traveled this way and was captured by these upright polywog creatures. I know not what they are. I know that they stink. And that now I must relinquish my search for revenge for their capture. There'll be more chances, big friend. If... If the Morning Lord sees it and wills it so, I will have my revenge. But it's actually not that important if I think about it. Well, I'm just happy to be among friends. You guys uh, spend a little time kind of doing recon around the area. You feel like it's relatively safe. Um, and you, you sort of set up a, a watch plan. Throughout the night, there's there are no encounters. There's no interruptions. You guys are actually able to get a pretty decent night's sleep. Um, and in the morning, as the sun rises, everybody has benefited from a long rest. So you can go ahead and adjust spell-wise and hit point-wise mm. from that. That's good. Yep. I like was wrong. <laughs> I don't actually use Bardic Inspirations for Flourishes. You can do them once per turn. Nice. Okay. Um, so I'd like to uh, nail one of my, take one of my little shrine kits that I've assembled and um, put the my holy symbol on a little wooden desk, disc, nail that to the uh, tree and then hang the sack that's got various little, it's got a, a day's rations and a small bottle of liquor and two candles and knick-knacky kind of things like that and just a little offering slash uh you know something for weary travelers and to turn them on to the uh the good word of harlong and so i, I nailed that to the tree at some point <clears throat> and, and with that you you have started a tradition which thousands of years in the future would become known as geocaching <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and you do this and you feel uh, not only like your, your, your personal convictions restored, but again, you feel a tingling. And upon assembling this, this uh, faith-based geocache for weary travelers, you take a look at your compass. You see your compass kind of spinning around in a circle for a few moments, and then it spins and it ends up on north. And it kind of like does one of these like vibrating things north. Um, for the most part, those of you with survival or history, you know that the, the deeper into the thar that you go, the more dangerous it kind of becomes mm -hmm. because that's, that's where these different tribes tend to set up their strongholds. Um, mm -hmm. 
but you are not sure based on where you are, if there is anything that is a, of a potential danger, uh, at least in the immediate area. Hmm. Well, what do you so, think, friends? What should we do now? I am at your bidding. Whatever you do, I do. John, what, what's with your compass there? I saw you looking at it. Well, I, uh, <clears throat> I, it guides me uh, in a uh, unorthodox fashion. It, it doesn't always point north. It just points to where uh, I feel Harlong and is guiding me, where my path extends. And um, it's telling me to go north. So I say we, we continue that way. If you'll join me, friends. I got to Be aware that those are dangerous areas. I look forward to the challenge. I fear well. not the challenge. I accept it. So you guys uh, kind of pack up what you have left. <clears throat> begin heading north. I grab uh, those... Uh, those rations, whatever we didn't use. Okay. Yeah, you're able to grab, they're, they're like five days of dried fish. Um, you have you have uh, kind of a, a weaving sort of back and forth trying to go from dry patch to dry patch procedure as you go through this, this swampy, vast swampy tract of land. Um, and your, your, your paths are kind of hindered by the fact that this terrain is difficult. So you're, you're not making great amounts of speed. Um, it takes you half of the day to travel 15 miles, but you get to a certain point and, you know, after kind of stopping for lunch and occasional drinks of water from your supplies, you get to a point where you start to see a lot more of those tree stumps and a lot more dry land mm. as if maybe this area at one time might have been more forested and and therefore the root systems had supported more soil um, and you guys get to a good patch where you see tree stumps and, and occasional dead trees fallen trees and um, you see these these patches uh, seem to kind of connect more and it, it's almost like you're on a nice plateau of dry uh, land surrounded by this marshy, mucky land. But the, the, as you guys are walking, you feel like the land is kind of spongy. Like you could definitely feel like you are walking on kind of tree roots that are, are supporting your, your land. And about maybe another five miles later, as, as the, it's getting to like late afternoon, you guys see kind of a, a rise in this plateau um, up to kind of a hilly area. And you even see some trees, some like intact old trees. And sort of at the top of this short hill, you see what looks like a fort. Like there's a wooden palisade around it. And there's stone buildings and some buildings with like wood roofs, um, slate roofs. And, and this does not look... Uh, like a temporary camp. This looks like perhaps this was something that had been built a while ago. Um, you do not see anyone occupying this place. You don't see any signs of like, a, you know, campfires or anything from within. But the sun is setting and you're a couple hundred yards away when you guys see this, this wooden fort, uh, wooden palisade and fort on top of the hill in front of you. And we're pretty far north end, so this would probably be considered like a fort encampment, maybe. Um, yes. To, to his knowledge. So, so if you, for those of you who are, you know, have, have history, you, I think it would be reasonable that you would know, for example, that over the centuries, there have been different kind of um, incarnations of, of rulership in the Thar. Uh, at one time, there was actually like a human kingdom of the Thar 
that was overthrown by ogres. And then the ogres ruled the Thar. And then orcs ruled the Thar. And hobgoblins and goblins have been known to rule the Thar. And then, you know, civilizations even amongst those kind of broke up and things became a lot more tribal and primitive. Um, so it is entirely possible that what you see could be some old fort from a bygone era. Hmm. Hmm. An interesting, uh, interesting encampment there. And normally I try to avoid such places. I prefer to be out in the woods, but we could investigate just to make sure there's no one there that is doing any harm no, to nature. I see no cooking fires being set up or smoke, so it's not a sign. It's, that's telling me there may not be anybody there. I drop down on all fours as to not have my large frame be seen if, if there is someone in there, and I start to crawl. Okay. Anyone else kind of moving forward in a stealthy fashion? Yes. All right, make your rolls. 17. Uh, natural 20. Three. Nice. Three. Natural 20. <laughs> all right, so uh, all of you except for Rollfish are moving <laughs> incredibly stealthily. Um, and you guys get to basically the base of the hill. And there are a few trees at the base of this hill that are still intact. They look very old. Um, and you guys kind of cluster around these trees. And you see this, what looks like it used to be an actual path. There's like stones and gravel, but it is long since overgrown, as if perhaps abandoned. Uh, you see that there are uh, large weeds and vines that have grown up around the wooden palisade. But you see up this path is a set of double uh, doors, like a gate, wooden gate. None of you detect food sounds or smells or, you know, sighted anyone moving around, uh, at least from what you could see at the top of the wall. Um, would you like to approach uh, the gate? I turn to my friends real quick. Friends, I could go investigate quickly and come back and report. I have, uh, I have means of remaining unseen. Would you prefer to wait or are we all go? Up to you guys. I don't know if it's wise to go alone, but I will be nearby. John, I will think? wait here. Uh, it, it makes sense to me to uh, do a little reconnaissance, and if you're if you're able to do it unseen, why, that's a blessing. Very well. And with that, he vanishes. And Uses invisibility. Okay. Oh, well, well. You have seen this kind of magic before, um, but this rollfish seems to be full of surprises, and he disappears. Uh, rollfish, you approach. Yep. You see that the gate is closed, but uh, it okay. seems like you could climb it pretty easily. Um, it does not seem well maintained. Like there's mm -hmm. moss moss growing all over the stonework and all over the larger timbers that make up the structure of this palisade uh, and vines that have grown up and weeds all around it. So it does mm. not look like from the exterior, like this yeah. is active fort. Uh, well, using the disrepair and the vines that seem to be growing everywhere, I climb up and I peer over and I take a look as far as I can see. Okay. Um, when you climb up to the top, what you see is what looks like open grounds. Uh, there are some small wooden buildings on the interior that look like um, perhaps they were some, some storage areas. And then, you know, beyond that, it looks like uh, a castle. The castle is also not in good shape. Okay. So it's, it's, it looks very, and by, by castle, I should probably rephrase as a keep. Um, okay. it's, it's a stone building uh, of decent size with uh, a very dilapidated roof that looks like much of it has rotted out and fallen in. Mm -hmm. Vines, moss all over this place from the damp uh, climate of being in the swamp. 
Yeah. And there is a stone tower as well. The tower seems structurally intact, but the roof is just gone, like like yeah. totally collapsed in. And some of the some of the stonework at the roof obviously crumbled as well because you see it in heaps. Yeah. And it doesn't look recent because it's like on the ground below the tower, but that has moss growing on it. So this looks like <laughs> it has not been in use for many decades. Okay. Uh, I see no signs of life whatsoever. Uh, make a perception check. That's not bad. That's a uh, 16. All right. So, you know, you're, you're kind of scanning the grounds. You're scanning the, you know, those, these, these, you see these buildings, you would have to go in for a closer look, obviously. You mm -hmm. definitely see right below you that there is an old rotted timber that is what's keeping the, the gates closed. And then mm -hmm. when you were looking at the top of the tower, you noticed that like one level below uh, the top of the tower was like a, a stone arched window. Yeah. And you saw something flying around on the inside, something large, um, kind of like, like the size of maybe a big bird. Okay. Um, That's like, crazy, but interesting. Yeah. Well, I climb back down and jog over to my friends and I'm still invisible and I say, friends, it's me, I'm here. Yeah. You guys hear Rollfish. You look around. I'm still invisible. Don't worry about it. Okay. What did you see? I climb I climb the uh the fence and there didn't seem to be any signs of life. It's very, very old, it seems, and then disrepair. I maybe I saw a bird at one point in that little stone tower, but that's about it. Uh, other than that, it looks like a like a ghost town without the ghosts, thankfully. Hopefully. I asked him before we move on. Um, I could cast uh, speak with animals as a ritual. It would take ten minutes. Do we want to take ten minutes to see if there are any animals in the area, or is that not think... something that? We need to worry about. If I was waiting ten animal, minutes, I would sense them. I can sense when animals are near. Okay, you you know that there are like creatures that are denizens of this area <laughs> that are small animals, but um, like you you've seen a couple hawks, you've seen some kind of like swamp rats basically, but you know, nothing really um, that has demonstrated that strangeness that you observed South uh, with, with the infection and the rabid animals. There are indigenous creatures here, but there is nothing that poses a threat to us. That's wonderful news. Maybe we should go in and take a look then. Maybe some, find something interesting. Let's explore. Let's go. And well, since you can't see me, let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to climb over the fence again <laughs> and take off the uh, wooden block so we can open the gate without making up too much noise, of course. And I'll do that when we're ready to go. Okay. So you guys are able to open up the gate. It's not, like I said, I mean, the timber that was holding it closed was rotted anyway. So you're able to open up the gate and you, you see essentially like an abandoned fort. Um, there are <coughs> these wooden buildings, these outbuildings. And as you kind of look through, the grounds have like many weeds that have, have grown up over the years. It just, it's kind of wild. Um, there's moss that has grown over most of the wooden buildings. Um, some of the outbuildings are open and they look like maybe they were stalls for horses and like there's, you know, barns. Um, there's even like some like sheds basically that had like tools uh, and all of it's rusted out. Like you see like a lot of saws and axes and stuff that look like maybe it was used for timber that are just totally rusted out. Um, there is a well and the well 
looks like it might have had, you know, a, a, a pulley system with a bucket, but all of that has like collapsed. Uh, but the stone ring of the well is still intact. And you, you can kind of look down and those of you with dark vision can see that there's very mucky, dirty kind of rainwater at the bottom of this well. Um, yeah. The keep itself looks like a fairly sizable stone keep. Definitely, um, you know, in its day was probably very structurally strong uh, and the tower still kind of intact on the far side um, also looks like it was in good shape. The main gates into the keep, um, those doors are completely splintered and broken off as if maybe they were destroyed a long time ago and left just, you know, the wood is rotten, the frame is you know, kind of swollen and damaged from, from moisture. So hmm. you see that, you know, on, on kind of going into the keep, that's sort of what you see. How far are we from the keep itself at this point? You're about 60 feet away from like the doors of the keep, just kind of across the open grounds. And the keep has the tower that, that uh, Rollfish saw the or heard or whatever the bird in, yeah, the whatever it is. Um, it I'm going to uh, see if I can get within about 30 feet of the of the bulk of the uh, the the main part of the keep and cast detect evil and good. Ooh, what what is the range on that fine spell? Uh, self and 30 feet, a sphere looks like. Okay. Mm. Well, fish kind of walks up to the front of the, the keep, just looking around, not, not doing anything else yet. I'm kind of standing back because I'm hesitant to go inside the buildings. It's not my favorite place to be. I'd rather be outside. So as you as you cast it, you don't sense anything initially. Do you walk towards the keep as you're doing this? Sure, yeah. Okay. Um, you <laughs> get to the, the front door um, of the keep, and you, you see that there's like an open hall, like there's an entrance foyer and a hallway, and there are rooms off to the left and right. You sense in both the room to the left and the room to the right, you sense that there are undead. All right. You That's sense no that the room to the left also has been magically desecrated. Ooh. Uh, make a perception check as well. 20. Wait. Yeah, 20, 17 with plus three. So you see something that you didn't notice from further back. Above the arched double doors, the, the, the stone, the frame, even though the doors are blown out, the wooden doors are blown out, the frame, the stone frame is still intact. And above the stone frame looks like there was at some point a marker placed into the stone. Uh, that looks like someone has scratched it out. Now, it seems to be a symbol, but again, it has been kind of like somebody took like metal and scratched at the stonework uh, to kind of defile it. Um, make a religion check. Is anybody else moving up with Jaunt, by the way, or are all you guys hanging back? I'm kind of, I'm pretty close to Jaunt, and I'll probably walk up to him. Okay, I'm hanging back. Around. 30 feet. Okay. I'll stay 20. in between both parties. Uh, 19 plus one on the religion check. Okay. You recognize the symbol as the symbol of Lathander, the morning lord. And it looks like this was put into the architecture of the building when it was built, but long ago desecrated and scratched out. 
Well, I pass all this along to everybody. Okay. Undead friends, beware. Undre- undead up ahead. Ooh, Off to fun. the left, magical desecration. And behold, the ancient mark of Lothander, the morning lord, but it has been defiled. They dare defile my god. Pull out my Sorry. sword and my dagger. Battle axe and shield. Who's ready for some fun? Moriana. I inspire. I inspire jaunt. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yes. So I I move up to up to my up to the party. I say, don't really want to go in there, but I'm with you guys. We're a team now. Aren't you against I, undead? Shouldn't it, shouldn't you think it'd be stamped out? We'll take care of them. <laughs> Surely they do your forest no favors. No, they do not. Okay. Well, shall we? So shall tell we. me tell me what your marching order is as <clears throat> you are entering this building. And again, I'll describe it for you. As you guys are approaching, Jaunt is kind of leading you in there. You see that through these the wrecks, r- wreckage of the double door, uh, and the frame of the door, he, you know, he points out, and and um, Voros, you, you see your god's symbol, and it looks like it was scratched out. Um, you see the foyer, the entrance to what was maybe a regal uh, foyer, long ago, you know, just collapsed. There's a lot of water damage from the leaks in the roof, and there's just debris all over the floor. There's moss growing on some of the surfaces. And you see doors to the left and to the right, and then a hallway that continues past that, as well as stairs that go up to the second floor. Um, Jaunt quietly indicates to you that in in the rooms both to the left and right is where he sensed the presence of undead, but that the rooms to the left in particular seems to have been desecrated magically. Uh, Make perception (laughs) checks before you guys even walk in. I forgot I'm still invisible. I could go take a look. <laughs> 14 for perception. I also have 14. That was a natural one. Okay. Uh, 11. All right. Those of you <clears throat> with the 14, you notice that another uh, circular emblem is above the room, the doorways to the room to the left. And it also looks similar to the one that was above the keep entrance. And it also looks scratched out. And there's also like scorch marks as if someone burned at this stone emblem. Well, Rollfish walks up to the left door entrance. Is it open? It is. The doors are actually intact and they are closed Mm -hmm. on both the left and the right side. Oh. And it is quiet. You guys don't hear any movement. You don't hear any talking. It's, it's quiet. I'm standing back just inside the doorway. Okay. Sean, where are you? Uh, I'm with, uh, well, I Moriana. suppose I'm, yeah, I'm with Moriana and, and I'll cast a light <clears throat> on the tip of my bow staff. Okay. Uh, Voros, where are you? Attempting to enter the room with the symbol over. Okay. Um, Rollfish, you're still invisible. So you see Voros, the dragonborn, walk up to the doors where you're at. And he's I get out of the way. Handles. I get out of the way. Okay. I'm right next to you, friend. Uh, don't Voros, sneak up on me. You hear, you hear the voice. I told you. <laughs> and, and you see that there are handles that seem to be intact on these doors um the doors do not seem locked you can turn the handles and open them i will search the surrounding the door for any type of wiring or traps that are apparent to the eye sure make an investigation check. natural one (laughs) you are you are certain that there is nothing trapping this door 
There is no way that any <laughs> alarm would be set on this door. I proceed to open the door. When you open it, you guys all hear the sound of chimes. Tring, 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 <laughs> tring, 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 like as if somebody laid a whole bunch of chimes right in front of the door. And it's, you know, like when you walk into a store and the door opens up and it chimes. Like that's yeah. what happens. And it reverberates throughout the house. Um, Rolf, Rolf, see, Rolf says, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. Over, over Voros's shoulder, you see that the doors open up into a room and all of the windows have skins up over them as if to block out the light. It, the only light coming into the room is from John's light cantrip over Voros's shoulder. Uh-huh. Now, those of you with with dark vision can see that this room might at one point in time have been like a parlor or a library, but that all of the furnishings other than the built-in bookshelves have all been moved out. So it's like an empty room and on the built-in bookshelves are collections of skulls. And these skulls, oh. I mean, there are probably 200 skulls of different shapes and sizes. <laughs> um, Many of which are like bleached and look older. Some of which are kind of look a little more fresh and still have like bits of flesh stuck to them. And you see there's a, uh, a what looks like it might have been an old desk. But now this old desk has looks like it's become kind of a, um, <clears throat> maybe an altar of some kind. Mm-hmm. Because you notice that there is the skull of a ram that is on this altar. And there is a wooden bowl that has little bones in it. Uh, and you notice that all this kind of seems, this, this paraphernalia in this room seems to have some kind of ritualistic component. Mm-hmm. And off to the far left side, about 20 feet deep into the room, away from the doors, you notice a large-sized um, wooden crate. And it's... it. It's unmarked in any way, shape, or form, um, but it is a large square wooden crate, like the kind that you guys would frequently see coming, being unloaded off of the ships in the port mm-hmm. cities. Um, the, and this wooden crate seems not to have a lid. It stands at about four feet in height. So from where you are, you, you could see that it doesn't have a lid on it, but you just can't see what's inside of it unless you want to walk over there. I say, uh, you didn't have to tell the whole castle it was dinner time just because we got here. I tried to search for traps, but there are certain things that I am not good at. Well, now we know. Go inside. Okay. Still invisible. Start checking things out. Is there like anything in here besides that box and altar? Uh, like a person? No. There's skulls. Okay. okay. There yeah. are there's the the desk that looks like it's been turned into an altar. And then about 20 feet in at the far corner of the yeah. room is the box. Hmm. Um, I'd like to out the altar. One one moment. On the yep. level okay. of passive perceptions, um Moriana and Jaunt, as you guys kind of you're, you're like looking over your large dragonborn friend's shoulder into this mysterious room that has like where the windows, the light of the windows have been blocked out by thick animal skins. Um, sinewy, like not perfectly scraped animal skins, like just sort of like ripped off of a body and nailed up. Um, you guys hear something coming from the doors behind you across the foyer in that other room jaunt where you had detected the presence of undead you hear scratching at the door well thank the blessed wanderer that that door is shut you say as the door opens (laughs) i'm for initiative (laughs) time for initiative there we go 21 on the initiative. 17. 14. All right. So uh, let's see. Rollfish, you said 21. Yes, I did. John, what do you have? 14. 
Uh, Moriana. Eleven. Okay. Uh, Voros. Seventeen. Seventeen. Not bad. Um, the dummies have a four. <laughs> and badass has an eighteen. Wait a minute. Badass. That's not. That's Wait not what I wanted to hear. Uh, <laughs> You didn't, you didn't really think that at level whatever you are now that you'd be just fighting bully wolves, did you? That would be disappointing. This isn't what the pamphlet said. <laughs> how far right. away is the door? Or how wide is the hallway? So um, the, the front entrance, the, the foyer, is 20 feet mm -hmm. wide. Okay. So you, yeah, so basically, Moriana and John, you were kind of at the the door to the left and the the door behind you is about 20 feet away and you hear the door creaking open uh rollfish you you kind of get to go first you're invisible and you're you're at the doorway looking into this weird scary voodoo room um with with voros but you hear the scratching behind you and you see john moriana kind of turn and look and then you see the door open and you see a skeletal hand opening the door. Uh, but you are up first in initiative order. So what would you like to do? Roll fish. Are you muted or are you just thinking? I was muted. Um, <laughs> do I, did I hear the scratching? Yeah. Because I'm, 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 I'm in the left room. You are just inside of the left room. Uh -huh. You heard... You heard the creaking of the door and the scratching. You turn to look over Boros's shoulder, mm -hmm. out back into the foyer, past Moriana and past Jaunt, and you see a skeletal hand opening the door. Is it wide enough to shoot inside? Yes, but if you roll a one, you're going to hit one of your friends. Please say that you do it. Please say that. You do it. Uh, of course, <laughs> I say that I do it. So I'm going to shoot shatter in, just inside the door. Okay. <clears throat> like past the door to whatever's opening it. All right. So they have to roll. I'm not, I'm, I don't have to roll. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's within your range, right? So yeah. Yeah. I'm going to make, what, what was that again? Con or deck? Say, yeah, it's con 12. Huh. Huh. This is probably going to wreck them. Good. Um, okay, hold on. One, two, three. I'm gonna roll damage anyway. So we got. Oh, ooh, actually, awesome. wow. What's your spell save DC? Twelve. Yeah, three. Uh, well, so let's just say that some of them are going to fail. <laughs> have something. Um. So what is what's your damage? Eighteen thunder damage. Okay. I don't think so, bone fingers. And I shoot shatter through the doorway. <laughs> All right. You are your own greatest hero. And you have just, you hear this like rumble of thunder and you, you, you hear bones crackling. Um, I'm not going to say any more about that because you don't see yep. what else happens. But of course. suffice it to say, you hear bones as if some bones just fell on the floor. Impressive, uh, my orc friend. Yes, you, you're like impressive. And then suddenly out of that big wooden crate jumps a, a big skeletal skin barely covering his flesh warrior Fuck. with like basically a <laughs> skull face and like frazzled hair and bits <laughs> of flesh. And he jump. I mean, ju when I say jump, I mean like fully wog level of jump, right? He jumps out <laughs> oh with a sword and comes down to attack. I, and I'm now I'm visible too because I broke my invisibility. Yeah, you are. All right. Uh, that is a 15 plus. Oh, if it's, yeah, <laughs> that's a hit for me. 19 to hit. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. It hits me too. I don't know who he's attacking. Uh, 
Oof. Rollfish, uh, you, that hurts. Uh, uh, you are going to take 10 points of damage. 10 points. That's as you are point. slashed by a sword. Okay. Uh, Ow, what the hell? Sorry, second attack is 17 to hit. Oh, against, God. Uh, Voros. That's a tie. <laughs> you will all, you're going to take seven points of damage. Okay, this brings us to you, Voros. This creature that just jumped out of the crate and like swipe swiped you guys is clearly not some basic skeleton. It is moving with the ferocity of an angry member of the undead. Filled with rage from the attack, <laughs> I oh. pull my battle axe into action. All right, Rage on. 22. Nice. Yeah, that's a hit. What's your damage? It is. What's my rage damage? Well, it's going to add two to your attack. Add so. two to my attack, so... It's a 1d8 plus 4. <clears throat> 8. Okay, 8 it is. This brings us then to Jaunt. Jaunt, you are terrified. You you've never seen an undead move like this. This is not this is not a zombie or a skeleton. This is something quite fearful. Uh, first, I have a question about the the. Did you roll fish? In fact, uh, in, do bardic inspiration on me earlier? Is that yeah, what you said? I, I did, yeah, I, I did it earlier. Yeah. yeah. And so what is, gotta, does that get me? That like it, gets me. It gets you. Let me read it you for get you. To add it a die to roll a d six yeah. to to a skill check or an attack or a saving throw. Yeah, or a saving throw. Okay. Um. And another question is the the skins were covering up were they covering up glass windows? It looks like or well, just okay. I would say that based on the fact that you were the one that walked up here to scout things out, you could see that that there were glass windows, but the skins inside seem to have covered up the sunlight coming through. Hmm. That's why it's dark. Okay. Hmm. Um, is there anything nearby on the ground even? Like rubble or rocks or anything like that. No, um, um, you you could make it. You can move to one of the windows if you wanted to, like bust out the skin cover the 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 uh, covering. You could because yeah, the, gonna... the creature is attacking your two friends, so you can move there if you wanted to. I'm gonna try that just on the off chance that sunlight harms this thing or. At the at the worst, we'll be able to see a little better in here. So try and bash out a window. You you do. You run over to one of the two windows. You take your bow staff. You rip through the skin covering it and smash the window. And and the light <clears throat> from outside comes into the room, and you can hear this thing do this terrifying screech. It it doesn't seem to take damage from the sun. Like it's not like suddenly bursting into flame. But it screeches and and uh, you see it seems to be like thrown off of its game. Um, nice, uh, Moriana. This brings it to you. Okay, how far yeah. away is he from me then? Uh, he came up to the door, or he, he is ten feet away from you, and he is currently attacking Rollfish and Voros. Uh, behind you, the skeletons that are behind you are twenty feet across the hall. Okay, I'm going to move back 10 feet, and I'm going to cast Moonbeam. Ooh, Moonbeam. Nice. That Moonbeam might, that is might a silvery beam of pale light that shines down in a five-foot radius, 40-foot high cylinder. When a creature enters this spell's area or ends its turn there, he takes two D10 uh, Brady so damage. Like a con save. Okay. Con save. Yeah. Okay. All right. Con save is. Uh, he's got a pretty good con. Let's see. 
His is a plus three to the roll. Uh, I don't know that that's going to do it. He's got a nine total. I'm assuming your spell save DC is better than that. <laughs> 14. Okay, so he will take the full damage. Go ahead and roll that up and let me know what it is. And this is radiant damage. That is only five. I rolled terrible on that one. Okay. Um, so nice. on each of, it's a concentration spell. So on each turn thereafter, you can actually use an action to move the beam 60 feet in any direction. Right. Okay, got it. All right. Uh, good. This brings us to the skeletons who now are eager to come and attack you. Um, they, they lumber out, creaking angrily, and they begin clawing out at you, Moriana, since you are the closest victim in the hallway. Uh, their attacks are not great. Two misses, ah, and a nat 20. <laughs> of course. So you will take 10 damage from one of the vicious claws raking uh, across you. Um, how, what is that with my concentration then? Do I have to take it since I took damage? Yes. Do I have to roll a uh, constant okay, saving, saving throw? That is then a 13. Yep, you're fine. Okay. All right. Top of the order, Rollfish. <clears throat> you saw some crazy things just go down. Um, right. You saw as as jaunt. Actually, you know what? Mm, hmm. I'm not just going to give this to you. What? Make an insight check. Me? Yes. Okay. Me? Uh, it's not bad. That's a 17. All right. You, when when jaunt went in and blew through the the skin covering the window and, and, and opened up the sunlight coming through, you mm -hmm. actually notice the reaction of this creature as it, mm -hmm. it shrieked in, in frustration and anger, not so much like pain, but you mm -hmm. see that its eyes were like, it like closed its eyes almost all the way and kind of like puts its arm up. Yeah. Even though the light's coming from behind it and it, it, it's swinging its sword kind of a little more wildly now in yeah. a defensive fashion. So you're, you're up. Uh, was it wearing armor? You said, or yes, I can't remember. Yeah, metal yeah. armor. No, it, it is wearing. It's wearing like it looked like basically like some kind of like maybe used to be a human uh, warrior. Uh -huh. Like, and the way that it moved, the way that it wielded its sword, definitely showed like skill in battle. Yeah, yeah. I just I just want to know if it had metal. So anyway, I I move around to it, its back and I say, "You dare hurt me!" And I come in with the um, attack. And that fell on the floor. Ah, oh, damn. So I'm pretty sure an eleven doesn't hit. No. Uh, it's it's wearing very limber, like studded leather armor. Um. Okay. So, uh, this brings us to it. It is going to try to attack you, but now, thanks to the sunlight, it has disadvantage on its attack. Please no double between the, between the 12 and the 2, the 2 is what it must choose, and therefore it misses you on the first attack. The second attack, 7 and 12. So 7 plus 5 is a 12. Does a 12 hit you? Nope. No. All right. It swings wildly, seemingly affected by, by the dim sunlight in the room, but nonetheless mm -hmm. thrown off of its game as it's swinging wildly and, and just doesn't even really come close. Mm -hmm. uh, this brings us to Boros. Boros I have a... you also now, as your friend moves the circles around it and Jaunt opened up the sunlight into this room, you see this thing is angry and it's it's just kind of wild swinging. Um, I have a meta question. The way that my uh, rage works as a bonus, uh, as a bonus action, can I attempt to pull the skins off the windows or the blind, like the skins that are hanging and attack, or is that two different situations? Um, let me think about that. So basically you want to attack the thing 
I want to attack and the then thing move to and a then window move to and the windows and start pulling uh, the skins the other down. Yeah, I'll let you do that. Okay. It has nothing to do with your rage. It's just basically your action economy. So okay. make your attack roll first. 19. That's a hit. Roll damage. 11. Nice. Okay. You swing, you run by, you hit it, and then you grab at the other skin. Um, you're, you have ample strength. It's just nailed up. You just rip it down. And there's enough light coming through the window uh, that you now see that this light coming from the two directions, one where Jaunt opened up the light and the other wall where you're opening up the light, this thing is now even more pissed off and it does this terrible high-pitched screech <clears throat> again. Nine. Um, Jaunt, you are up. You can clearly see the impact of shedding light in this room, and and this creature seems to be, you know, still defiant, but obviously affected by the brightness. Uh, I'll sacred flame of daybreak. Bring a sacred flame down on him. Okay, what's your spell save DC again? Thirteen. He fails. What's the damage? Seven. Seven more. All right. This brings us to you, Moriana. You got okay. three, three skeletons that are clawing out at you. Okay, I have my uh, moonbeam. I would like to move that over to it's to the closest one that's next to me. Okay, so it you is a five foot skeletons. Right. It. And they have to make a uh, con save. Yeah, it's it's going to fail. Um, they're up next. So, what's the damage on that? That is, uh, I'm going terrible. That's four damage, man. Oh, that's enough. Another skeleton oh, just cool. stops. It's animated corpse in mid swing to claw at you, and it crumbles to the ground. Its its skull rolls off in a direction, and the bones just kind of fall. The other two, however, are, are seizing forward and trying to lunge at you. Uh, one is definitely a miss. The other one is an 11. That's a miss. I have okay. 13. They, they both are just dragging out at you. One tried to grab you on the throat. Both of them missed. Um, this brings us back to the top of the order. <clears throat> the okay. angry undead warrior is still whipping around despite getting attacked on all sides yeah. from magical divine powers and physical attacks. I, I'm going to bonus action inspire Voros, and I'm going to say, come on, friend, he's only a bag of bones. We can finish him off. And I'm, then I'm going to roll to attack. That's better. That's a 16. That's a hit. Okay. And as he's doing this, he's going to use one of his special, um, I don't think it's a bonus action. Let me double check real quick. Okay, I can see this once per short rest. Because he's pissed off that he got hit. He's going to use Orcish Fury. So that's eight on the eight, that's 13 slashing. And what that does, I can roll one of the weapons damage dice an additional time and add it. Okay. It's 13. Oh my God. That's 21 damage slashing. 21. <laughs> wow. 39, 44, 52. You guys have done 52 damage so he's far. That's, still not dead. That's really good. Yeah. No, he, he's definitely getting jacked up on all sides. <laughs> um, he is going to attack you. Obviously, he still has disadvantage, um, but he's going to attack a 9 and a 17. So he has to take the 9, which is going to be a miss. His second attack, God, a two and a 15 also misses. <laughs> um, Voros. As he lunges wildly and misses every time he turns, I go to breathe my ancestric fire breath <laughs> upon the warrior. Oh, All right, let's do it. 19. Uh, yeah. Save. That was a save. Does he have a save? Oh, 
Yeah, it's a save. It's a DC. Uh, what is it? DC twelve. Where to go? On save or what? What? What is it? Red. Oh, uh, deck, deck? Dex, dex. Dex save. Um, actually, hold up. Oh, dude. I don't I'm sure. know if I'm not gonna say that you did that because you had known your own power. But you know, if you blow this cone out, you're gonna burn. <laughs> you're gonna burn rollfish. <laughs> oh, he's in. He's in proximity. It's a cone. I'm right, red. It's I'm a right behind him. Cone. Okay. So you would you would wow. torch rollfish if you do this. I thought it was okay. I'll like swing. Jaunt, it. jaunt is behind you. By I the other, I could directionally send it. I'll rolling. stay there. Yeah. If if there's some of the dragon breath that's a line, and then some that's a cone. This is a cone. This is a cone. Okay. Yeah. I didn't. So I you want that. to? I'll, I'll let you use him. your your roll to hit as a hit. Okay. I'll, okay. I'll just swing the battle axe instead. Yeah. So give me your damage. <clears throat> uh, nine. Okay, he is just stumbling around, very wounded. That would have been really cool. Uh, yes, it would have gone. <laughs> you're up. Uh, I'm gonna do another sacred flame. Okay, he fails his save. What's the damage? Eight. Okay. What's it look like? Describe what Jaunt does when this guy drops. Nice. Um, once again, I mean, he's fallen back on his new method of uh, this verbal <clears throat> aspect, but when he's all fired up like this, he goes back to his old school sacred flame of daybreak and then just sort of... And you, you guys sleep. see this, like this sacred flame up here. Again, this column of, of from where and when you're not sure but the light just bathes this, this undead warrior. And, and he, you see, he kind of like stiffens up and then like falls back. Praise far long and Moriana. Well Moriana, you are the yeah. only person in the hallway. You were the only person in the hallway and there are two skeletons left. But moreover, your significant passive perception reveals to you the sound of footsteps coming from upstairs. Remember I said there's like a stairwell that leads to a hallway on the second floor? You hear footsteps shuffling towards the, the balcony overlooking the foyer. Uh, okay. There are two skeletons the, in front of you. Wherever the steps are, I'd like to move my, uh, is that less than 60 feet? Yes. I'd like to move the moonbeam directly in front of the stairs <laughs> and have it stand there. All right. That's as, oh, that's my action, right? It's not a bonus action. Yep. It is an action. Oh, then I can't attack those guys. Oh, well, that's okay. Okay. That's my, my bad. The skeletons. Um, one hits, one misses. The claw does three hit points of damage against you. And okay. after that, you hear the shambling sounds of walking things. You're not really sure what. And one of them is going to have to make a con save against your moonbeam as it walks directly <laughs> into it. And fail. What is, the, what is the damage? One moment, please. That would be nine damage. Oh, that's enough. So here's what happens. Uh, just as you guys defeat this skeletal warrior, you hear like, and and you see a brightness. Um, I'm trying to think of who would actually be able to see this from from the doorway. Um, I think it's oh, only t it only radiates ten feet. The Rollfish, you you out of the corner of your eye, you see Moriana like turn her gaze, and you you kind of like peek out. So you get to the doorway of the foyer. You peek out, you see there's still two skeletons attacking her, but you notice that up the stairs, there's the <clears throat> entrance to a second floor hallway. You see a zombie shuffle through, walk into this light, and then just basically start to crumple, and it falls over the banister and splats on the ground of the foyer. <laughs> <laughs> nice. um, Wonderful. And that brings us to the top of the order. So Rollfish, you can see now that there are more of these zombies in that mm -hmm. upstairs hallway heading towards the balcony. 
and mm. but there are two skeletons actively attacking Moriana. Uh, I'll, I'll get out and yeah, I'll get out and help Moriana and attack one of the skeletons. Okay, go ahead. Uh, sixteen. That's a hit. Good. Uh, eleven slashing. That's enough. You slash through its rib cage, and and it falls apart, deanimated. Um, Voros, you hear the sounds of bones falling in the hallway outside. I follow suit with my battle axe and okay. attack the closest skeleton. Okay. There is one still trying to reach out for the throat of Moriana. 17. That's a hit. 11. Wait, also dead. 10. Sorry, 10. Yep, more than enough. Um, this brings us to you, Jaunt. You hear, well, you see your two comrades run out in the hallway. Um, and you, you're about 10 feet away from the entrance of the door. How far am I from the uh, makeshift altar with the ramp's head and the? Also about ten feet. Um, well, I'm just on the odd chance that this thing is somehow fueling or you know, guiding or whatever these guys. I'm just gonna like take my staff and bash the ramp's head and just sort of sweep all this stuff off the altar, and then use my movement to go out in the hall. Okay, you do. You kind of run past. You just smash and bash. Everything just gets destroyed, knocked off. You run out in the hall. Um, this brings us to Moriana. There are no skeletons currently attacking you, but you see where you put your moonbeam is an optimal place because you could see just through the hallway that there are more zombies, like walking towards it. And less than 60 feet? Yeah. Then I want to move it move my moonbeam again to the nearest zombie. Okay. They will enter their turn, so they're going to have to make a con save in your moonbeam, which surprisingly makes it. There's a 16. Cool. So is it half? Oh. <clears throat> um, wait a minute. I forgot to check. Yep, half as much. So yeah. go ahead and give me the 2d10 radiant. Okay. That moonbeam is pretty cool. That is 12, so they get take six. Yep, got it. Uh, the next one pushes through, but moves through it. So it, it gets through, and same with the one after that. Okay. Uh, this brings us to top of the order, Rollfish. At the top of the stairs now, descending the stairs, you see uh, three zombies. Uh, what's the range? They're like 15 feet basically above you okay above you and in front of you right i'll use my last uh effort of magic and i cast shatter and i envelop two of them okay that's a con save 12 con save 12 or two of them fail fail three and a seven perfect damage bag of bones let's see that's one more that is 17 thunder damage. Jeez. Jeez Louise. That's beautiful. <laughs> uh, two more fall. There's one zombie making its way down the stairs. Uh, Voros, you see this zombie coming. Looks like perhaps in its life it had been like some kind of human. Uh, looks long dead and very rotten. And it's making its way down the stairs in a stumbling fashion towards you guys. I tell... Rollfish, move out of the way, friend. I do so when a seven-foot-tall dragonborn tells me to move, I move. And I then move. I unleash holy hellfire from my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. And it's a deck save. Uh, yeah, uh, he's a zombie, so here's my deck save. Ready? Three. <laughs> 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 11 points you so the so so how does this happen you you kind of push through describe how this happens because he's going down move friend the, the flames just pour out of your mouth and and just funnel up the stairs towards this zombie who is immediately engulfed in flames 
and takes one more step as like a flaming column of flesh and then stumbles down the stairs, burning and lands at the bottom of the stairs in a burning heap of desiccated flesh. Um, other than the horrible black smoke and the burning <laughs> flesh smell that now permeates the air, it is relatively quiet. You guys find yourself in this foyer. You don't hear the sounds of any more scratching or shuffling of feet or screeching of undead warriors. Um, but this keep has a lot more rooms in it um, mm. that you may want to explore. Yes. Let's clear out the rest of the rooms. Mm. Anyone feeling a little under the weather like myself here? Need a little help? I am slightly injured. I'm slightly injured, I'm, but I think I'm okay. Okay. Well, I'm going to cast... I can, uh, I can do cure wounds on you. Save your magic. It's probably stronger than mine. And I cast Save cure wounds magic. on myself. Okay. I'm okay. Okay. So I, I got eight back, so that's funny. So, um, you guys, you know, in the, in the silence following this battle, the, the room where the undead warrior was um, no longer seems as vile as it once had been. Um, the room across the hall, uh, as you guys kind of walk over there, you see that it was not cleared out. It seemed to have all of the furnishings that may have once indicated that this was um, some kind of dining area, some kind of dining room. The table and chairs still being intact. Um, the the dressers, uh, not dressers. Um, oh God, I'm drawing a blank. Like the end tables, basically the long tables where all the the plates and dishes and all that stuff would have been stored. The the china cabinets, like all of these things are intact. Now they are very dusty, as if this room has not been maintained well. But it looks like these skeletons that came out of here. Um, at one time might have been the denizens of this home. Um, but they they long ago rotted away, their flesh rotting away. Um, you're not really sure even what gender they were because they didn't have any weapons, they didn't have any clothing, uh, and they were truly animated skeletons. Um, but you notice that further down the hallway, uh, in the first floor, that, that hallway continues down into kind of a dark hallway, and there are more doorways off to the left and right and straight ahead at the end of the hallway. Before we go any further, I'd like to go into that room to the left and look at their, there were bones that were on the altar, you said. And oh I'd yes. Like to, they're very much on the floor now. I would like to look at those. If there are any kind That's of animal that. bones that I recognize and I'd like to take one. I follow uh, and add it to my yeah. necklace that I have. I have the teeth of a bear the bear that I, one of the first animals that I killed. Okay. You, you see that the bones uh, that were in the bowl look like finger bones, humanoid finger bones. Um, oh, I don't, I don't the take ram, don't The take ram's them. skull is smashed. All that stuff is on the ground. Uh, and the room now, as you look at it, while still very macabre with the collection of skulls on the shelves, um, looks like it probably was at some time someone's office, yeah. but as I said, the only remnants of that, other than the built-in shelves, is the desk that was used as an altar. But the top of that, all that stuff was cleared off and smashed by John. You said that the skulls were all humanoid? Yes, of various sizes. So you figure that there's probably quite a few, perhaps human skulls, goblin skulls, orc skulls, quite a mix. And not to put any ideas in your head, but none of them were jumping or moving or nope, animated <laughs> in any way? Okay. Do um, any, uh, does any literature remain on the shelves? No. The only thing that, that remains of what this room might have been is, like I said, the desk itself. I'd like to check to see if there are any drawers and look through the drawers. Mm. There we go. Um, yes, there are drawers to this desk. 
There is a central drawer and two side drawers. They are all locked. Ah. Can uh, I cast detect magic, please? Yes. And I start just walking around this this uh, room real quick just to see what's going on. Anything magical? Okay. Um, there is something magical inside of the desk, inside of the central drawer that's locked. Ah. There seems to be something in the desk that is uh, emanating a certain magical what school? Uh, necromancy. Foul necromatic magic in the desk of some sort. I walk back out into the hall. I don't like that. <laughs> well, considering I'm not proficient in thieves, so I try to smash the desk and break it open. Okay. With my beefy muscles. Are you a gray skinned half orc or green skinned or what? Light green. Light green. What would I roll for this? Um, nothing. It's a desk. It, it's not going okay. to be <laughs> You smash it open. And in the top drawer, when you smash open the top drawer, um, a bunch of loose papers fall out. They look very old. The paper's actually kind of uh, brittle. And mm-hmm. you see something metallic with a chain fall out and clink onto the floor <clears throat> as well. Looks like some kind of amulet. And mm-hmm. that is the source of the magic that you were detecting. I pick it up with my dagger. Oh, look what we got here. Uh, the papers are also magical. Oh. They're also necromantic, I imagine? Yes. Interesting. Um, you guys are watching this, I'm assuming. Yeah. I'm out in the hallway. Okay. Just kind of uh, studying next- it. What does this amulet look like specifically as I look at it? It is a so it's a gold disc, gold disc. with a uh, kind of a red gem in the center. Mm-hmm. And it has runes all around the circle <clears throat> of the disc around the gem. And then mm-hmm. it looks like there are uh, little flames, like gold flames that kind of come out from the center. Considering I have expertise in Arcana, would I be able to maybe think about, I've seen yes. this somewhere before. Uh, go ahead and make a roll. All right. My expertise is a paltry plus four. <laughs> That's a 13. Um, you're not sure if you've ever seen this before, but you feel like it, it has something to do with the necromantic action mm-hmm. that was going on here. Yeah. Uh, you feel well, like maybe if you spent time studying it more and attuning yeah. to it, you could conceivably understand more about its powers. Uh, I've got some better uh, for that, but we'll save the it. The four later. sheets of paper are also magical. You recognize yeah. them for what they are. They are scrolls. Mm-hmm. They're spell scrolls. And I'll, I'll inform Jaunt and Varos, who are, I think are still standing with, here with me. I'm not sure where Moriana went. Well... I think this thing had something to do with what was going on here. I'm going to put this here. We'll study it later. I have certain capability. And these four... What? Go ahead. Would, friend, this is dark magic. Oh, of course it is. I don't plan to use it myself if it's going to hurt me, which I'm going to find out soon enough. And then I roll up each scroll and I put them in a pouch as well. Okay. Do you study what the scrolls are with Arcana? Uh, I give them. I give them a look just to see if I know offhand. Like as okay. I as I roll each one up. Uh, just one roll. Arcana roll. Okay. Better. That's a little better, but it's only fourteen still. Um, I will tell you if you know what those are. I will say two of them. You you could figure out what they are. Okay. Um, the first is a scroll, uh, that's divination based Mm -hmm. and it looks like it's for the ritual of augury. Okay. Uh, there are notes 
about the ritual, you know, with, with the spell scroll itself, um, that specifically indicate that you need some specially marked sticks and bones. Um, you, you also see that there is a, uh, let me look up the level of this one. Cause I don't know if your arcana check would be sufficient. Yeah, actually this one too is fine. Mm -hmm. The second one that you're able to decipher is that it's a scroll for the spell Unseen Servant, oh, which that's is a conjuration neat. spell, mm -hmm. uh, and also a ritual. And you, mm -hmm. you feel like that's one that you could actually, like if you spent time, <clears throat> you could actually, mm -hmm. you know, maybe, maybe learn that spell um, as, as a bard, that you, you conceive that it is possible for you to to maybe learn that the augury one you're not so sure about but jaunt you you are familiar with that spell you know it's a it's it's a divination spell but uh but you know certainly one that that mm -hmm. is within the potential for you to be able to learn mm -hmm. and utilize um well, i wonder if i knocked the the special sticks and bones off the table is that maybe <laughs> uh, what those were you you figure that that might have some some relevance. Um, the other two spells you would have to study a bit further. Those scrolls yeah. are a little bit more high level than what you're familiar with. Of course. I just uh, step them away and I tell John, maybe this one might interest you later if you want to check it out. Something about divination and augury or whatever, if you want it. Mm, very interesting. Thank you. Let's, let's clear this place out first. There's still more, I imagine. So the hallway that goes down through the, the middle of the keep, like I said, it extends for another 60 feet. And there's a door on the left, a door on the right, and then a door at the end of the hallway. Uh, this hallway is about five feet wide. So you guys are kind of single filed on this hallway. Mm. I'm uh -oh. staying in the back. Yeah. Okay. Who's up front? Who's Morris, would you front? like to go or shall I go? Well, last time I went first, I rang <laughs> the bell as it were. So um, <laughs> what do you think, friend? Uh, I guess I'll take the front on this one. I will be right behind you. I'll be behind Boros. Okay. All right. Um, so Rollfish, make a perception check. You get perception. down halfway down this hallway. And you're approaching the doors that are on the left and right. Mm -hmm. Five. <laughs> you don't hear anything. Like you don't hear scratching. You don't hear <clears throat> moaning, groaning, zombies shuffling, anything like that. It's <laughs> dead silent. Uh, I, just I will behind. say that there are yes. a lot of cobwebs and dust yeah. permeating the whole place. Uh, just... And this hallway doesn't have any windows shedding light into it. So the only light other than your dark vision is that which is coming from John's posting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I look behind me and I point in my ear and I just like, hey, we're good. And I walk into some cobwebs and start coughing. Okay. And then, uh, you want to walk past these doors or are you going to open one of them? Uh, I'll look, I'll, I'll put my ear to the right one. You hear nothing. Okay. Check out the left one. Nothing I you hear Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Any keyholes? Uh, no. These doors are intact. There are no keyholes. They are just closed. Well, I'll just go to the right and I'll say that one. And I open the door. Okay. You open the door to what looks like a, a kitchen. There is a Modest amount of sunlight coming through two windows. Mm -hmm. The kitchen looks like it has not had any usage in ages. Dust covers everywhere, but there, you know, you could see where there were counters and chopping blocks. Um, there's a pantry that there's like a small door that goes to a small pantry just beyond the, the working space of the kitchen. 
and mm -hmm. uh, a simple doorway that opens up into the dining room that you guys uh, had seen previously. There's all of the, the things that you would find in a kitchen. Pots and pans are still there. Ladles, spoons, knives, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, the pantry oh. is, uh, is uh, what's left of what's in there. Looks like it has been consumed long ago. Uh, by mice and other rodents. There's just, you know, there's packaging strewn around. There are a few jars of what looks like perhaps some preserves that long ago burst from yeah. just, you know, yeah. fer fermentation that went wrong. So <laughs> um, nothing in here is edible yeah. or salvageable uh, unless you wanted to put together your own mess kit with yeah. cooking supplies and cutlery and stuff. Uh, other than that, everything in here seems to just be a kitchen that was once capable of serving quite a lot of people. I turn around to my friends. Just the kitchen. Didn't really see anything in there. Uh, I didn't sense anything magical, did I? Because I still have nope. the tech magic on for 10 no, minutes. No, if you're concentrating, you do not detect anything magical in there. Let's check out the other door. Um, I open that one. Okay. This also, nice bright light. Um, looks like a living room at some point in time. There, there are a number of chairs and couches and, you know, nice end tables. Uh, there's like a stone fireplace built into the far wall. Um, and, and everything seems to be intact, but again, just <clears throat> covered in a layer of dust and cobwebs as if it was long ago abandoned. Um, there are some keepsakes that are on the mantle. Um, there's, you know, little shelving, built-in shelving units here and there that have various trinkets. Um, as you guys kind of search through, you, you basically are able to recover um, a, about 10 uh, little decorative elements that are each worth about 10 gold pieces. 10 of those? Yeah. So there's, you know, statues and, and you know, carvings and, and just different kind of decorative elements some some porcelain, you know, keepsakes. Um, yeah. I'll take a couple, like three of them. I'm not going to carry everything. I want to no, check out the mantle. Don't detect though. any magic in this area. Yeah, I just want to check out the mantle and see, like, maybe there's, like, a, you know, a family picture or something or identify who used to live here. So you go to the mantle, uh, and that's where you find some of the keepsakes. You don't see any pictures. And in fact, one of the odd things in, in this keep thus far is you don't, you didn't see any paintings on the wall or any tapestries, hmm. uh, or any books for that matter. Nothing that would indicate the history of this place. Hmm. Strange. As I put a few things in my pocket. Um, you guys go back out into the hallway and, and again, it continues for another 20 feet before it dead ends to another door. Just one? Just one door. I put my ear next to it. Okay. Not locked. You don't hear anything. You could see a little bit of light coming under the crack of the door. So there's something mm -hmm. obviously on the other side where there's a window. Yeah. Well, let's check it out. I'll open the door. Okay. Uh, you open the door and there is a, a room that's about uh, 15 by 15. And it looks like there's a, a lot of coats and clothing that are hung up there. A few hooded cloaks. And you see that it kind of splits off into uh, a T. Basically, there's a hallway that oh. goes on each side. I'm and there's, the there are windows all throughout this hallway in this room. Um, and it looks like down each end of the hallway are doors that go to smaller rooms. Uh, so there's like four rooms on each side of the hallway. Okay, on each side. And all of them are, are, have doors that are intact and closed. Um, at the end of each hallway, you see a door that looks like it leads outside. Okay. So what do you think? Should we go left or right? Everyone, I, I address the group. Both eventually. Where should we start? Left. Left? Left it is. So all of you guys make investigation rolls. Okay. 
whether Nothing you magical. have proficiency or not. Nothing magical, I assume. <clears throat> 16. Okay. Natural 20. 12. Nice. Investigation. 14. So basically, you guys, I'm not saying you split up, but you go down the left hallway and you, you kind of have this system where you open the door, you check it out. What you get by the time you've searched the four doors on the left hallway is that these are small rooms, possibly like servant rooms. Mm. They're just like literally 10 by 10 rooms um, off of this hallway. Very humble, like basic kind of setup where there's, you know, either a bed or a set of bunk beds uh, and a dresser and, you know, a small kind of armoire for clothes. Very, very simple kind of accommodations. Uh, and again, you kind of think that maybe these are like servants' rooms. Um, nothing of value. Everything's covered in dust and cobwebs. When you go off to the right, you check and you find that all of those same things are the same paralleled on the other side, except for the very last room. You open up the door to that and you see that it is a small landing, like a five by five uh, landing and then stairs that go down into uh, what you assume is like perhaps a, a wine cellar of some kind. I wonder if any vintages remained. Let's hope. Oh, we find out. I'm glad yeah, you're here with us. Same, yeah, same marching order. Rollfish is going to be up front. Okay. Um, so again, this is dark. There's no sunlight. And the stairs seem to go down 10 feet and then hit a landing and then turn and then go down another 10 feet. So you... You walk down the first 10 feet. Yeah. Make a deck save. <laughs> I just thought about <laughs> the, trying to check and then I didn't. That's why I need Ooh, to know all of your passive yeah. perceptions. Yeah, that's a fail. I rolled a natural three. Okay. So you're walking down. You guys follow Rollfish down, presumably. You get to the yeah. landing. You He starts walking down to you know around. And as you guys are kind of making the turn on the landing, there's a a shuffling, like a wooden slide sound. And the stairs on the second half all kind of fold in into a slide. Oh, and oh no. The slide down. <laughs> okay. Now, each one of you in turn needs to make a saving throw. So, Voros, you're up next, and then Jaunt, and then Moriana to make a deck saving throw. 17. Okay. You you grab out to the walls and you brace, brace yourself so you don't fall. Uh, Jaunt. 13. You start sliding down the wooden slide. Uh, uh, Moriana. Can I do athletics or? No, this or is no, a deck save. Just decks, okay. <laughs> That's a five. Can they, pile, <laughs> can they pile up against me? No, you. here's what I'm going to say happens. You you kind of spread eagle and brace yourself so you don't slide down, and they go right underneath your legs. Yeah. So you, <laughs> the three of them crash down. Now at the yeah. blessing of, Jaunt, of Jaunt's light, uh, you guys crash into a heap on a earthen floor. This is an old old cellar, earthen floor cellar. Some stones, and you you crash into a heap of dust. There are huge cobwebs all over the ceiling. You can see the floor joists mm -hmm. above you, um, and it looks like this cellar must go underneath the entire keep because for the range mm. of your dark vision, uh, well, for the range of Jaunt's light, you could see that it extends to an entire 30 by 30 space. And uh -huh. so basically you're in the corner of the keep, but there are wooden walls, uh, no, sorry, not wooden, uh, stone foundation walls that seem to be uh, around this entire area. Did you make it down all right? Are you down there? Can you hear me? Yeah, we're down here. <laughs> we're okay. Uh, Voros, you are up. able to, if you want, you can make an athletics check to, yeah. to, to uh, climb down. Make my way down. Uh, 23. Yeah. Nice. You, you do. You just shimmy on Is down. There... Um, there like uh, any sconces and torches in the in the sconces or anything like that? No, this is this is like foundation walls and dirt floor. Uh, mm. You feel like if you go off 
to to the left, uh, there might be some opening between the foundation walls, kind of in the opposite corner of where you guys are. Mm. Uh, it's not revealed by Jaunt's light, but it's more like those of you with dark vision, you're just able to see just past the edge of Jaunt's light. It looks uh -huh. like the foundation walls have a little gap. And I just froze oh. up. Can you guys still hear me? Yes. I still hear you. Right, there we go. How high is the ceiling? So you're you're below the joists, uh, and and it looks like you're about fifteen feet below the keep. Okay. Below the floor of the keep, and it is definitely cooler down here. It's a little bit cooler. Mm -hmm. um, you know, around you are foundation walls, and like I said, there's interior foundation walls that seem to come to a, a corner, but there looks like there's a gap between them. How's it um, smell down here? It smells very earthy, okay? And I will also describe to you that as you scan around the foundation walls to your right and straight ahead of you, you see that this was probably at some point in time actively used for storage of goods. Um, you see some casks and some barrels you also see some very basic wooden shelving that's been set up with um, like boxes, wooden boxes of, of different things. Uh, you see more jars that look like they maybe contained preserves, many of which have long since, since burst. Um, Any wine bottles? You do see some bottles, yes, but you also see some casks, some small casks. Um, and upon further investigation, you find that there's some of the, the wine bottles have gone bad. The corks rotted out. It smells, you know, like the, basically vinegar. And then other wine bottles uh, in one of the casks seem to be intact and have some decent wine. I'll take one and put it in my pack. Okay. I will as well. All right. Of course. Got to have something to drink. Okay. Yeah. Grab one as well if there is. Um, I point out to the other corner. I believe we can keep going if we want to keep investigating. It's kind of hard to go back the other way anyway. Yeah. That's Am I the only one that needs uh, light? You, do you guys all have dark vision except for me? I don't. Yeah. I see, you I don't. don't. I see just. I see just fine, friend. All right. Yes, well. Yeah, so it would appear that uh, Voros and Jaunt being close together, you guys can both see um, from the, the light on Jaunt's uh, bow staff. Uh, but Rollfish and Moriana, you guys, your, your dark vision extends a little bit past that. And you could see that where the two foundation walls would seem to meet, it looks like there's mm -hmm. a gap, some kind of opening. Mm -hmm. All right. So, and look what that gap is. Okay, let's have a look. As you guys approach, um, there is indeed a span between these two foundation walls where there are two pillars and you guys get closer and it's a very small opening. Like the tall people will have to duck down because it's only a five foot tall opening. Um, mm. But there are stone stairs from this fine five foot tall opening that descend down even further. And with, with your dark vision and Jaunt's light, you could see that these stone stairs descend down about 20 more feet. They're, they're kind of steep stairs, not quite like a ladder, but they're sort of steep, short stairs that descend down. And there's, there's definitely more uh, kind of stone foundation walls that descend down with these stairs into this vault. Before we yeah, that is where we'll end this episode of the Moon Sea Adventures. <laughs> Make sure that you like and subscribe. Click on that notifications bell so that you don't miss the next epic adventure as this group embarks yeah, yeah. on their explorations of Thar. Thank you, as always, for watching. Thank you to all my patrons, and we'll see you on the next game. Peace out.
Well, hello, it's me, Wizzy. I'm back once again to remind you to subscribe and click on the notifications button and also watch videos that are over there. And then don't forget to tune in to the next episode of whatever show you are just watching and crafting videos and DM tips and pro tips for vlogging and all sorts of gaming things.